Hello and welcome to another edition of Real Talk of Colorado, and I'm your host Wati. Now, we've all been through some, you know, in and out of different situations, uh, trials and tribulations, and never had the opportunity to have a second chance, you know, an opportunity to turn things around. Well, today, that's what our topic is, second chances. So uh, I have a guest today, uh, my man Stefan Showtime Gilbert is, is here to talk to us about how he changed his life around and the things that he did prior to turning his life around. So please welcome Stefan to the show. All right. How you doing? All right, man. It's good to meet you again, bro. Yeah. Um, well, let's just get into it. Kind of tell us about, you know, who you are, you know, where you're from originally, if you have any siblings, you know, mother and father, and the kids. Well, as you know, my name is Stefan Gilbert, as you just said. I'm originally from Los Angeles, California. I was born there in 1988. I left California in 94 and came to Denver, Colorado, where I've been at for the past 20 years almost, mm. you know. I got two younger sisters, Jahani and Stephanie, and I got two older brothers, Kenny and Dante. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so let's, let's, let's start it off like this. Um, so tell us a little bit about California and you know, living with your mom and pops there. Well, I was young, but I, I kind of remember a little bit. It was real fast paced. Mm. You know, it was a lot going on. My dad was hooked up in the, in the streets real tough, so I kind of seen a lot of stuff when I was real small. Mm. And that's kind of what gave my mom the decision to move out here after he had passed away. Yeah, California was, it's like, it's a couple of paces faster than Denver, Colorado, you know. And it was, yeah. So she felt like coming here where her parents were, it could kind of slow things down and we can kind of get on track, but it kind of, it's all the same. Life is kind of like what you make it. So. Right, right, I hear that. So talk about your mom a little bit. What was you and your mom's relationship like? Me and my mom's relationship started off real rocky at first. Like, I was bad, I was rebellious coming up as a teenager when I was younger, but I think she sees a lot of my dad in me, so she always tried to protect me. And I never had any other father figure around after my dad left, you know, there were people that came and went, but nobody that was actually permanent. So over as the years progressed and I got older and I start understanding, you know, like my mom wasn't really trying to shelter, cover me from the world. She was just trying to protect me, like help right, me right. and show me like what I was doing, what I thought was right was wrong. When I thought I was grown, I wasn't grown. Mm -hmm. So now me and my mom is good. We're like best friends. Best you know? friends. Yeah, we're okay, good. Okay. We have our rocky situations, but all in all, me and my mom are we, we see eye to eye, finally. Okay, so what was the relationship between you and your brothers and your sisters? Well, my oldest brother, he kind of keeps to himself, Kenny. He's a real character, he's a real smart cat. He's mm -hmm. still in college. So I talk to him every now and then, not as much. My second oldest brother, he was like my dad, you know, because he knew my dad mm -hmm. before I did when they moved out to Los Angeles so many years ago. So he's like the more He's who I'm more, I take after more because right, right. I looked up to him more because we were into the same things. Mm -hmm. You know, we were into the streets, we were into trouble. My little sister, my second youngest sister, Jahani, she's like a female version of me. Mm -hmm. It's crazy looking at her, talking to her. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. And we, our relationship is good. You know, things be rocky because she's at the age where, where I used to be at and me and my mom would get into it. Now I'm right. telling her what she needs to, she needs to get on track. And, mm -hmm. you know, she's like, well, feeling like I'm just trying to not let her live her life. Oh, she's okay. at that stage, okay, okay. teenager. And my youngest sister, who I just basically met mm -hmm. a few months ago, mm -hmm. she is like the spitting image of me and my dad. Mm -hmm. But I've still been trying to get to know her more and more. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, there was a transition from California to Colorado. Kind of right. speak a little bit about that transition. And, and and I guess we might as well dive into the subject at hand. Right. Speak to us about, you know, how you got into the gang life. Well, in California, when I was out there, my whole family was involved with the gangs, you know, like, like literally my whole family. Everybody from my aunties, my uncles, my cousins, every single person. So coming here, it was it was kind of easy and hard. It was hard to transition because I was used to the fast life. Even as a youngster, I kind of caught on fast. But it was it was easy because it was like, well, I already know what I want to do. I want to be a gang member. You know, I know that's all I knew. So coming out here in 94, after my uh, dad had died, my mom, 
she felt like this would be like a safe place to raise her kids, mm -hmm. you know, where we wouldn't get in any trouble or we wouldn't get caught up in the street life because this is not California, this is Denver, Colorado, but it's the same thing all over, you know. Yeah, it's the right. same everywhere you go. There's a hood everywhere. Everywhere you go, right? Yeah. All right. Okay. And um, did you what when what school did you go to when you first got to Colorado? Um, and what grade was it that you started? And kind of tell us, um, you know, how how that experience was when you when you started going to school. When I first came to Colorado to Denver, the first school I went to was Smith Elementary, mm. and at that time I didn't know that it was a it was predominantly blood neighborhood. You know, I just was young. I, I started wanting to, being a wannabe around like nine, mm -hmm. ten. You know, like at that stage where this is what I want to be. I already know, like I want to be a crip. Mm -hmm. You know, so and I didn't. I wasn't really. I didn't know that like, this is where the enemies were at. You know, mm -hmm. so I'm walking around every day doing what I do, and I'm catching it from everybody. You know, at a young age. Yeah, so. And I and that's kind of like what made me, like how I how I am now, or and how I progressed, like mm -hmm. feeling like where I came from, it was actually gang banging. Like I had to do it every day. I didn't get a day off. Yeah, right. You know, it was it was real. Like I was getting pressured. They was pushing that envelope every single day. You know, so Smith was. I had a few friends there, but mostly it was just confrontational every day. You know, it was just problems every single day, even in middle school, elementary school, middle school. It was just a lot of fighting. Okay. A lot of fighting. This uh, that's this a day in the life, huh? Just dead. That was just it. Fighting. Wow. Okay. So, you you said you went to Smith. Yes. And then what's what, what grade was that at? I came in '94. Started school out here. In the end of 94, so it had to be in second, third grade. Oh, wow, okay, yeah. so that was really early. Real early. So when we left Smith, what school did you attend? I went to Smiley, uh, Mill Smiley Middle School right up the street on Holly, yeah. Okay, how was that? It was the same, same just thing. enhanced more. We got a little older, started to know people more for who they was and who they were trying to be, mm -hmm. and I was still the same person, just a little bit worse. So you didn't have any type of guidance uh like you said, your father wasn't there. Yeah. But uh, did you play any sports or any people oh. in school that tried to guide you in the right direction? I had, I had, I played sports. I did theater and I played sports, but it all came second to the streets. Like, you know, I, what I wanted to be, I had already made my mind up. I didn't want to do nothing else. I didn't want to be nothing else. Basketball was fun. Football was fun. I looked up to a few football players and basketball players, but like, not having that father figure there to tell me like you can do this if you just get, you know get your mind right or you know not having that person there to actually push me mm -hmm. you know it was kind of like well I, i'm not going to play no football you know or no basketball and the coaches they all had their sons out on the field so they were really looking after their kids mm -hmm. the way i felt so it was like well i'm good at this but don't nobody believe in me mm -hmm. I believe in me when I come to these streets, so I know I'll be good out there. Did your brothers like try to take that role and fulfill trying to, you know, oversee the things that you did and ensure that you didn't get in any trouble? No. Nah. No? Not my oldest brother, he would love me from a distance, like, I want you to do good and we'd talk a couple every other week mm -hmm. or so, you know, but he would never be real firm with it. Like, it wasn't none of that. And then my second oldest brother, he figured that I was just like him and that I would be okay. Mm -hmm. You know, like He's good. Right, Step right. Stephon is straight. He's, He's gonna good. Be all right. Yeah, that's okay. basically what it was. Okay, okay. so th let's transcend the two. You know, um, when you when you you know brought the gang thing out here, what what set did you click with? You yeah. know, how did you get involved with the gang members out here? Right. When I came out here, I was still hooked on my dad's gang, Menlo Sixty Fifth. Like mm -hmm. it was like a branch off of Rolling Sixties. Mm -hmm. Some of the people that kind of started it. And I came out here, and I'm like, this is rolling 60s, or this is Menlo, you know. It, it only lasted a while before I started realizing that I can't come here and trying to claim something else, and ain't nobody else here with me to claim right, it. Right, you know right, what I mean? right, right. Mm -hmm. So it was like, it's not where you're from, it's how you come. Right, you right. Know? And I started building relationships with different people that were from the east side, you know what I mean? When mm -hmm. we first came, that's where we moved to, you know. So, and I was just, um, I was like, wow, they do this out here too. Mm -hmm. You know, like, man, I thought it was all bad when I moved out here, like, I was bored. 
And I'm like, man, they they out here shooting and killing stuff too, mm. you know. And it turned me on. Mm. Like so, in the first place I was at when it turned me on happened to be the East Side, mm. and it was the Crips over there, you know. And they like, look, man, you, we understand that you, out of respect for your dad, that you claiming his hood, but homie, that ain't how we do it over here, mm. you know. Mm. So, you know, you got to get down and lay down. Right, you know? right, right. I understand that. Um, so we transitioned to Colorado. You know, we started getting involved in the gang, street life. Yeah. So what, what what I like to know is, I mean, like, what that make you feel like? I mean, how did the gang um, sway you to want to be in the gang versus, you know, regular life, going to school, doing what you're supposed to be doing? How did that transition happen to make you feel like, you know, I have to take the gang route rather than doing what I'm supposed to be doing? It was easy, like the decision. It was just me being young and looking for love, you know what mm. I'm saying? Looking for some love back, mm. like, you know, like you can put all you, you put everything into something and you're expecting a certain type of feedback from somebody and you're not getting that at home. Right, right. And there's nobody else there to give you any kind of like constructive criticism or just even to talk to you and show you that they care enough because mom's always at work and my brother's always locked up right. and my oldest brother's not dealing with nobody. Mm. I'm watching my little sister, you know, it's like, man, where do I go to when I want to just release, you know? Like, mm -hmm. where do I go? And it happened to be the streets and the, and the homies, you know? And it was, and at, and at the time, it was so appealing. It was like, man, they actually care about me, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? They care about my whereabouts. Right, right. They care whether I'm good. They give me some money in my pocket. Yeah, I got to do this to get the money, or I got to do that. Mm -hmm. But they giving me a way to get this money and be okay. Mm -hmm. And they had called me and asked me, like, homie, is you straight? Are you good? You know what I'm saying? And if I had a problem, they would be the first people there, not my sisters or my mm. bros or something. You know, they would be there to show me that they like, look, I got you if you got me. All right, okay. So at that time, it was just that much appealing. It was like, well, man, this is what I want. Like, I love school. I love school to death, but it ain't nothing like having like you're positive that somebody cares about mm -hmm. you as much as you care about them. Like, okay, okay, let's take it to another step here. Let's. Let's speak on it. So I know when we gang banging and doing all the violent things, and I know what yeah. comes along with that, you know, dealing with that street life. Uh, so I also know it brings about, you know, opportunities to get locked up, you know, going to jail or prison. So have you ever had the opportunity to experience the jail or prison or yeah. the county? Yeah, I, I kind of skipped all the county and the, and the city. I went straight to the prison. Mm. Yeah, first time, first felony, first case. What was that about? What you do? I had been accused of hurting my son, yeah, mm. and neglecting my son. Mm. I had took him out to college with me in the summertime while I was uh, practicing for basketball and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, getting ready for the next year, and he got hurt while I was out there. And mm. since I was my son, I'm responsible for him, and I didn't really have a, a, a I didn't have a, anything to tell them. Like I don't know what to tell you. Mm -hmm. like, I don't know what happened. I can give you a scenario. And I was so young and I was so scared, like I didn't really, couldn't tell them exactly what happened to my two-year-old son. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was 19 years old, they're like, well, you know, you're not fit to be a parent. Mm. And you are too young and you're irresponsible and it, this could have resulted in death mm -hmm. and it just got blown out of proportion. And I took full responsibility because I could have been more responsible, but I just wasn't at that mm -hmm. time. You mm -hmm. understand what I'm saying? Right, like, right. It's just one of those things that happened. So how much time did you get behind that? Altogether, I did about two and a half, three years. And what was that experience in prison like? It was miserable. Mm. Yeah. And we said miserable. What, I mean, miserable in what form or fashion? Like, like every, if you think of the word miserable and you think of any circumstances that are miserable, it's just like that. So it's nothing any, to be glorified, you're saying? Wasn't, there's nothing in there that's cool. Every, daddy day camp, you know, man, uh, it was real. It's the worst place to go. You can't go home. You can't be like, all right, I'm tired of this. I learned my lesson when you ready. Mm. It's whatever the man tells you. If he tells you 20 years and you three years in it and you learned your lesson, oh, well, mm. you got 17 more years to do. Mm. You know what I mean? Like it's, you know, it's not up to you to live your life. They tell you when to use the bathroom. They tell you when to eat. They tell you where to look. They tell you what words to say. They give you the clothes to wear. Mm. You know. They tell you when you can see your parents. They give you the times you can call your people. They check your mail. Your, they all through your personal property. There's nothing in there that says individual. 
It says Department of Corrections. Thank you.